Okay, greetings everyone. Uh, I am James Carolyn, and this is Greg Conti. <laughs> I am from uh, US Cyber Command, and I teach at UMUC's cybersecurity program, and Greg runs the Cybersecurity Research Center up at West Point. So this is Lessons of the Kobayashi Maru. Uh, this talk is about some cheating exercises that Greg and I designed to help uh, people understand the adversary mindset and also illustrate some security principles. As the talk goes on, that'll make more sense. So of course, we have the obligatory disclaimer slide. Uh, most people see this and just hear a, a buzzing noise, but uh, we've, we, of course, have to put this in there. Uh, the views are ours only and not the government's. We are here on behalf of just us as free citizens. For those of you that speak Esperanto, there's a rough translation. So, cheating. Uh, growing up, everyone is ingrained in our psyche that you're not supposed to cheat. And uh, some institutions actually carve it in stone. Um, I wonder, uh, Greg, do you have any idea where this one uh, came from? I've, I've never seen it before. <laughs> it's from West Point. However, our adversaries don't think the same way. Our adversaries cheat. So just to be clear for our talk, we're not talking about all circumstances, right? So this was an isolated exercise that we did. Uh, we're not talking about cheating when you're not supposed to be cheating. But uh, this was an isolated exercise, so we're not promoting cheating in all circumstances. So for the two people in the audience that aren't familiar with Star Trek, and, and the Kobayashi Maru. The Kobayashi Maru is an exercise from, uh, that occurred during Starfleet Academy training, and it was designed to be an unwinnable uh, exercise. And uh, then Cadet Kirk uh, didn't like losing, so he went outside the rules of the game, and that's important, went outside the rules of the game, changed the rules, changed the program in the computer such that he could win. So he cheated. And this, uh, this was part of our inspiration as was for the Naruto fans. Uh, you may remember the journeyman exams where Naruto went in, the t questions were impossible, and about near the end of the exam he realized, I'm not supposed to actually know the answers, I'm supposed to cheat and not get caught. So again, part of the inspiration for this. And what this comes from is uh, the, the examples you'll see are from three iterations of the Joint Advanced Cyber Warfare course, which James and I put together. Uh, there's been uh, 80 students th uh, through it so far. And it's, uh, the, again, the idea you get down these people from various walks of life, trying to get them who they've never thought like an adversary, like many of the people in this room are very good at, uh, and how do you lead them down that path. So the idea of the test was to provide an unfair problem, something that they wouldn't be able to achieve through uh, routine studying, and uh, tell them uh, you know, with short notice that they have to prepare for this thing. And in, in our case, we told them we wanted them to cheat. Uh, and, and we told them the night before. It, but we also told them that this isn't a blanket exercise, like, oh, OK, you can cheat through the rest of the course because we did this. Uh, we wanted to avoid that. And the, the, what we chose was uh, uh, memorize or, or repeat back, regurgitate the first 100 digits of pi. Uh, and I know there's probably a couple people in this room that know that have already memorized the first 100 digits of pi, <laughs> but uh, not not our audience. So uh, we're going to run through some examples of the various cheats that students uh, came up with. Okay, and this is uh, one of my personal favorites. We had them read Little Brother X. Uh, to teach them about the importance of privacy and electronic civil liberties. And one, uh, the, the student here created a false book cover that matched the back of the book to, to, to match font size, color, everything, and tacked it on using, um, using hairspray. So this was left on the desk, virtually indistinguishable. And, you know, we had this as a course text. We had it, they had them laying around, and, uh, and you'd walk right by it. And we thought this was very, very clever. And then there's the everyday object. 
They had soda cans on their desk. The advantage here is that they could just, when we walked by, they could co conceal the answers and then move them out of the way. So we, we don't have an, ex we have many examples up here to show you, but we do not have the ceiling tile from the classified facility where this took place. <laughs> and apparently the student has 20-20 vision. Uh, but at the end of the day, the student, the evening before, the student climbed onto the, one of the desks, reached up to the ceiling tile and wrote the answers on the edge. And then somehow, during the exam with their 2010 vision, we're able to, to read the answers back the next day. Uh, and if anyone's going to take this class in the future, the answers are still there. <laughs> we had the obligatory name signs on the desk. One student took it home, made up the exact same uh, exact match, except they printed in fine print on the back, uh, just j the answers in very light gray font. And this was another another favorite because they uh, basically hacked the instructors. When during class, when we asked for when uh, when they needed paper, they saw us going to the printer. So you can see where this is going. They pre-positioned the answers in the printer paper tray asked us for a piece of paper, and we handed them the answers. <laughs> so this one was a really interesting one. Um, we had the student in a US government class that just happened to speak Mandarin Chinese and uh, used that as an alternate form of encoding and basically wrote the answers wrote the 100 digits of pi in Mandarin Chinese and had it out in plain view uh, on the desk. And Greg or I, neither one of us are fluent in Mandarin Chinese and had no idea what it said. Now, this isn't the actual document that he used. This is a picture from Wikipedia, so I'm not even sure what this document says either. <laughs> so another form of encoding that the students use was Morse code. So if you can see up there the uh, dashes and dots at the top of what was actually our class schedule, uh, for this, this particular class, he, he wrote the answers in Morse code uh, across the top. A lot of the students also uh, had alternative forms of encoding where they wrote a story. And uh, sometimes the stories didn't make sense. They just seemed like random words. But sometimes the stories actually made sense. And they would encode the stories uh, so that they could read it back and know which each letter or word represented to basically be able to regurgitate the digits of pi. And of course, there's the classic, the, uh, the yellow post-it note. So lots of different small pieces of paper hidden under keyboards, yellow post-it notes, and, uh, and what have you, all written very small where only the person sitting at the desk would be able to really see it. Then there's the pre-compiled answer. So we, as Greg talked about kind of with the printer, we didn't, uh, they exploited our laziness in this one. So we were too lazy to actually make up an answer sheet to give them. So we just said, take out a sheet of paper. And uh, the students knew we were pretty lazy. So they, uh, ahead of time, just wrote the answer down on a sheet of paper and had it buried underneath some stuff on the desk. And when it was time to submit your answers, they just wrote their name on it or whatever and, and turned it in. <laughs> So once again, you'll see a theme here. <laughs> you'll see a theme here of our laziness. Um, so the students correctly assumed that we weren't going to read uh, or check 100 digits for you know 40 students in each class. <laughs> so they memorized the first 10, wrote those down, and then wrote 90 random digits. <laughs> So we did have the students uh, turn off their monitors. We did do that. Um, however, one crafty student came up with the idea of having a PowerPoint, uh, three slides, two of them were black, and one of them had the digits of pi. <laughs> so you know, this was a proctored exam. So Greg and I are walking around <laughs> observing the students, and we would turn one way, and we'd hear a bunch of rustling, of course, behind us. <laughs> We would turn back, and you know they would be quiet. And so, of course, and we would turn one way. The man or the student with the 
slides, we'd be able to flip to the slide. We'd turn back, he already flipped to the black side. Slide looked like his monitor was off, so. It, it was pretty funny, the, um, again, behind us was rustling, but in front of us were just people looking, looking like this, <laughs> contemplating, <laughs> contemplating the, you know, the 77th digit of pi. It was pretty funny, actually. So uh, another book we had them read was Cyber War by Clark. Some of you may have read the book. Some people like the book. Some people don't like the book. But it's good for generating discussion in our class. But one of the students took the book. I mean, of course, you can't see the live. I'm sure you can't see the hash marks in here. But you can see them on the slide. And actually uh, just put hash marks on the edge of the pages uh, for the book. And uh, this one isn't encoded, per se. If you actually count the hash marks, you'll see 3, 1, 4, 1, et cetera. Okay, <laughs> so, so this one was actually done on the fly. Uh, we had a lot of students that like to bring in baked goods and other stuff in the morning, donuts and stuff. Well, it also happened to be Girl Scout cookie season uh, when this particular class was in session. So this student grabbed one of the paper plates uh, that morning, wrote the digits of pi on it, and then put a couple, uh, in this case, dosy -si dos uh, on top of the plate. So here's, here's the actual plate here. We don't have the cookies. Yeah. So this class is a four week, 160 hour class. Um, as you might imagine, soda and coffee are kind of ubiquitous to, to get through the class. Um, so one of the students took his coffee sleeve and it's kind of difficult to see on the slide, on the slide even, but uh, in the box there you can see yeah, the digits they wrote. So. so notebook camouflage. This particular student had a notebook that looked like that. Here's the notebook. <laughs> and you definitely can't see even on the slide there, but where it's located, if you can barely make out the blue ink uh, inside the box there, is where they wrote it. So the only person who's going to be able to read that is someone right up close to it that, of course, already knew it was there. So, so this is one of our favorites. Um, exactly, that's how they get through class. <laughs> um, Jim Christie, for those of you who know Jim Christie, uh, currently works at the Defense Cybercrime Center, um, came to talk to the class, um, and it was before we did the exercise, and he gave out a whole bunch of swag. Um, if you turn, well actually, probably can't read it, but if you in the picture it was turned around, it's, see it says, DOD Cyber Crime Center on the uh, actual roach clip. But the student on the bottom uh, engraved, not even just the digits of pi, he encoded it and then engraved it into the bottom of the roach clip that everyone still had on their desk. So being a good government organization, everything is barcoded for accountability. So one of the students uh, realized that he could make fake barcodes and just replace them on the monitors and such and have the answers right in front of him the uh, whole time. <laughs> so this student took an actual watch, uh, which he no longer wanted, obviously, and took off the glass face and then put on the face of the watch, again, encoded. It wasn't enough for some of these people just to hide just the digits. They had to uh, encode it and uh, put it on the face of the watch. So uh, and then, of course, was wearing the watch the whole time during the, during the test, and we had no clue. And it's a tag here, too, so it's, uh, I don't know if it's real or not. <laughs> Probably not. This is our last example, and uh, we thought this one was really good. So the student actually employed their young daughter to help them cheat. <laughs> the, uh, the, the daughter was actually quite a good artist. This is her original comic, and uh, so she drew the comic, and then you can see the what seems to be random symbols on there that, again, once again, the answer is encoded, but uh, he basically had this comic uh, on his desk during the, the whole time. Just here. All right, you're up. So as we were sitting through the previous talk and we learned that you, you, know, you can hide things in plain sight inside a Triscuit box, 
or inside a carbon monoxide detector. There's this amazing, you know, very interesting overlap with what we're talking about here. Um, it was, we were really surprised that we had these mild-mannered people come in and, but once we took the rule, you know, took, took away the, you know, the norms of not cheating, they were pretty good at it. And particularly the quiet little guy or gal in the back were tend out, tended to be the best, like the one that would climb, you know, the quietest person in class is the one that would write on the ceiling tiles, for example. But when we thought about it, we did a, a discussion afterwards about what they learned about security. And some of the things that came out, that cheaters, like adversaries, they exploit trust, both explicit trust and implicit trust. Um, we've already pointed out several examples where they exploit laziness. Again, a common failing in security. They exploit predictability and patterns. And they also knew the limits of what human perception, what you can, what you can see, the idea of blue ink on a purple background. And they also, uh, you, you think about uh, machine sensing, like the idea of antivirus systems. They just can't pick certain things up. They used everyday objects, the, tris you know, the Trisket box or the soda can, to hide their information. They'd look where no one else is looking. And many of the talks this weekend, uh, this, they're the same thing. Our researchers, the research being presented here comes from people looking where no one else has looked. They have uncommon skill sets and they exploit them. And we haven't covered this, but several of these came from the same student. So they had a primary plan and a backup plan in case, you know, um, they changed ceiling tiles in the middle of the, the, end of the night or something. <laughs> so we've got lots of people to thank. Uh, we, we pitched this idea to Mudge and had a good discussion with him, and he was all over it and helped, you know, helped really, really shape this concept out. So thanks to him. I'd also like to thank our coworkers. Uh, up there that uh, have been you know, teaching the course, and of course all the students that were involved. Uh, finally, we'd like to thank the good folks of Shmoo to give us a chance uh, to come up here and present this work. And if you're interested, uh, we have a, a short paper on it, and if you send us an email, we're happy to send you the link. It may come in handy if you're trying to, if you live in a risk adverse organization and you're trying to convince them that you want to do this, um, maybe this paper would help. And uh, we tried to, we thought about doing this with all the plebes at West Point, and I pitched the idea, and I got up a couple of layers, but uh, they weren't quite ready to go, you know, 1,200 students a year doing this. But uh, we'll see maybe next year. So with that, are there any questions? Oh. The question was, how do they contact us? So next question. Yes. Did, yeah, I, I, yeah, not in so, the session I was involved with. So, you know, when we told them uh, you're allowed to cheat, but you can't get caught. If you get caught, you fail. Um, there were some really good ones where they didn't get caught. There were a couple that were very not were not very good at cheating. We'll put it that way. But we didn't we didn't bust them. We you know we let them go through the exercise. But but they they weren't uh, very good at cheating. But most 98% of the class the students were. Really, the point was we we would walk around trying to raise their stress level. Uh, but we weren't really trying all that hard to catch them. Any other questions? Yeah, sir. Have you guys, uh, in the research period, have you dealt at all with the thought, the idea that, in fact, most people cheat most of the time, and in fact, actually can't gain weight most of the time, and don't get caught? We, we did, I'd say, well, James, go ahead and try it. Yeah. yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, you said it was interesting research. Have we thought about the fact that, that really cheating goes on uh, all the time and the whole object is, is not to get caught? Is that correct? Okay. Um, so, so, yeah, we've, we've kind of thought about the fact that, I mean, that's kind of the whole uh, underlying theme is that, you know, adversaries cheat. And, uh, you know, with, um, in the case of the U.S. government, you know, we've got a lot of rules and, and things we have to follow when uh, we're doing cyber warfare type things. And our adversaries don't necessarily follow those rules. So that was kind of the big theme in the course was that, hey, adversaries are cheating. You got to look at it that way. And we got to kind of start thinking out of the box. OK, maybe one final question. OK, ma'am. How much, the question was, how much collaboration did we get? Uh, I mean, this, uh, we, we worked with Mudge uh, and uh, to uh, kind of shape the idea, and we just, 
Oh, oh, sorry. Um, so how much collaboration do we have amongst cheaters? They were pretty much independent cheating, right? Yeah, surprisingly there wasn't, even though we told them uh, you can collaborate on this. Uh, well, a lot of it was probably because we also offered a prize. We didn't mention that. <laughs> we, uh, you, the prize we had, you couldn't really split, I guess. is probably one reason. I just realized it's probably why they didn't collaborate. Is Parking at the facility we taught at was horrendous, and so we offered a VIP parking pass to the winner of the contest. So. Okay, I'll take, take one more. Oh, I, how did how did we judge the winner? So I, I, I would think it was a it was a class vote, uh, but some of the metrics were they, they had a sense for elegance. If it was a good hack, they could sense that. Um, and you know, I, any other comments, James? No, it was mainly uh, peer vote. But you know, we 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 basically said here's the top five that we think, and then had the the well, class. Well, well, we've had three different classes. So uh, the one in the pilot class, the Little Brother X book cover won. Um, I believe this last class we gave it to um, the watch. The watch won. And uh, <laughs> I missed that. What was that? And then uh, I'm trying to remember who the second one well, was. The cartoon then. must have placed well, too. The I... cartoon did place well. We had runner-ups, of course. But uh, I can't remember who it was in the second class, actually. OK. Good, so um, we'll be out in the back uh, in the hallway if anybody else wants to talk some more and we'll get out of the way for the next speaker. So thank you.